It says meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm Dr. Ajay Shah, and I'm bringing you this uh, another great Facebook Live with a great guest. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, let me give you first update on our page. We have now crossed 30,000 followers. We have now crossed 30,000 followers. We have followers all over the world, actually. Matter of fact, a lot of followers in India, a lot of followers in uh, in Europe, a lot of followers in Australia. Obviously, our majority of our followers are in US. So welcome all of you. Um, uh, many countries, as we see, are getting high prevalence of chronic disease. And unfortunately, some of the uh, developing countries cannot afford the expensive care which we can afford in America. So our platform is taking this knowledge, this healthy lifestyle movement to everybody in the world to see if we can help them to be happy and healthy at a low cost just by changing their lifestyle. Uh, we have now about five to seven guests uh, uh, per week. We bring them live. We have expanded our pillars uh, out of six pillars to now more than six pillars. We have periodic live cooking demonstrations. We are on Instagram. We are on YouTube. So definitely we are in very exciting times. So if you are watching live, please share on your page so your family and friends can watch it. Please invite your friends and family to our page to get daily five tips and videos. And let me introduce you to today's guest. Today's guest is a greatly, greatly effective lifestyle coach who is certified by our College of Lifestyle Medicine. I always have believed and repeatedly said that many times doctors actually make lousy coach. Doctors can prescribe medicine in one second, but many times they are not very good at motivating people, not very good at coaching people. And we need more lifestyle coach in this country to make our whole country healthy and reverse and prevent many chronic disease. So our today's guest actually is a pioneer in this rapidly growing lifestyle coaching field. We are gonna learn a lot about how to start healthy lifestyle. So please sit tight. We can go for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Our guest today is Ruben Guzman. Let's welcome Ruben Guzman. Welcome, Ruben. Thank you, Dr. Shah. It's awesome to be here with you. I, I'm so thrilled and delighted. And thank you for inviting me to be on this program with you. I'm just really excited. I think pleasure is very mutual. We all learn from each other. So let me ask you a simple question. Where do you live? Where did you grow up? And who influenced you in your childhood? Okay, very good. So there's three questions. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I live in a place called Fair Oaks, which is a suburb of the Sacramento area in California. So Sacramento is a California, the, the state of California, uh, the capital. So I live there. And let's see, I grew up in a little place called Bell, B-E-L-L, -L, just like the ding dong bell. And so it's a little suburb in the Los Angeles area. My parents still live in the same house that I grew up in. So they've been in that house now for 60 years, 60 years in one house. So they're still there. My bedroom is not the same anymore. So, <laughs> but uh, that's where I grew up. And then uh, many people influenced me in my childhood. I was always the odd kind of a kid. Uh, I didn't fit in. I was, I was the social, uh, you know, just the unusual kid. I, I just didn't fit in. So, but I, I, I read a lot of books and I got connected to a lot of different people. Uh, one person who influenced me a lot was the writings of President John F. Kennedy in his book, Profiles in Courage. I loved reading those stories and his story as well. <clears throat> the story of leadership and courage. That was very influential to me. Another uh, book that, that influenced me a lot, a lot was the story of the young Olympic champions. And this was a story of all these young champions in the Olympic games. The Olympic games spoke to me and the Olympic spirit really was something that was very strong in my heart. Uh, another person who influenced me a lot was Leonardo da Vinci. 
So I, I was somebody, I, I read everything I could about him because he was the Renaissance man. I mean, he was somebody who was brilliant, who explored, he explored the body. He had, he had a, such an inquisitive mind and he really, he, he set up designs for so many things that became real later on in life. Um, and then another really influential coach for, uh, coach for me was coach John Wooden. John Wooden was the head coach of the UCLA Bruins basketball team, and he led them to 10 national championships. And I, I was such a klutz when it came to basketball. I was horrible in seventh grade. I was terrible. And I, I hated being picked on. Like I was the last guy picked for the teams every single time. And I wanted to get better. So I went to the library and I got coach John Wooden's book, Practical Modern Basketball. And I went out in the backyard and started practicing the drills that he had laid out in that book. And I ended up becoming a much better basketball player. So it was really great. And so uh, it was wonderful. And then one person that I, I wanted to pick in real life who really influenced me in terms of being, being in terms of healthcare, being a health professional, was my uncle, Tio Jose Antonio Alvarado. So when I was 11 years old, I had the wonderful opportunity to spend the entire summer in Nicaragua at my aunt and uncle's house in Granada, Nicaragua. So my mother's sister was married to Jose and my uncle Jose was the dentist, the one and only dentist in the town of Granada. Now, he was an amazing person his dentist's office, his dental office was right across the street from his house. And he took care of everyone. And I mean, everyone. It didn't matter if they were rich or they're poor. In Nicaragua, a lot of poor people. So he took care of people. And sometimes people paid him in chickens or in vegetables or in work. He never never worried about it. And the amazing thing about my uncle, he was, he, he worked so hard on everyone, regardless of how they could pay him. And it, and it was just extraordinary because he was truly in my mind, he was the happiest person I knew. He was always happy. He never lacked for anything. He always was, had a, a wonderful personality. He was always joking. He had always had stories to tell. And he was just a, a wonderful, happy person. He truly lived a thriving, healthy, happy lifestyle. And it was wonderful. And he was very influential to me. No, I think, so, uh, I think listening to your childhood, your role models, the way you describe them, how passionate you got on your face, the way you express yourself, to be honest with you, just by listening to you three minutes, I can say you are a good lifestyle coach because you have a story to tell. You know how to take role models and get influenced by them. So you have personally felt how to get influenced. And those people actually who, are get, who get influenced easily by role models can actually become an influencer of the people they need to influence. So I think uh, you actually come out with a perfect chemistry to be a lifestyle coach. And that's a message to everyone who wants to be a lifestyle coach that start with this kind of background and uh, you don't have to necessarily, you know, have a, a great college degree or, you know, other degrees. Just start with this kind of chemistry and you can become a lifestyle coach. So I really, really admire the way you put this thing together just right in the beginning. So I think people would be very excited on YouTube to finish whole hour with you. So I think this is exciting. This is very good. So let me ask you the next question. What made you interested into lifestyle medicine? And who was the person who got you into more of a lifestyle journey? This is a, a wonderful story that I want to share. So in 1980, I graduated from California Lutheran University and I majored in biological sciences pre-med and it was a wonderful experience. I, I put myself through college. It was a private university and I worked. So I didn't have a whole lot of extra time or money. So I, when I got done with my degree, I realized that I wasn't ready to take the medical college admissions test for medical school. 
So my plan was to work in the hospital and study. So that's what I did. So I, I went to the Los Robles Regional Medical Center and I started working there. And I started at the bottom. I was a phlebotomist. <laughs> so I learned how to draw blood. I was a vampire. And so <laughs> I drew blood, and, but I was eager. So the, the lab director said, well, Ruben, you got all the requirements for the medical technology program. Why don't you consider doing that? I said, sure, I'll do that. So I became a lab monkey. So I did chemistry, serology, hematology, urology. I did everything. So I did everything all there. And then in about six months, they said, well, we got an opening in the pathology department for histology, cytology, and autopsies. And I said, I'm in. So I started working as a pathologist assistant. And it was amazing because I got to see every specimen that came out of the operating room every single day. I lined them up, I got them prepared, I labeled them, all that good, good stuff. But I listened to the doctors dictate the, the examination of the tissue that, they, that had been excised from the operating room. And then, and, and then I got to prepare all the specimens for the microscopic examination. But then I also got to participate in helping the pathologists in doing autopsies. And that was amazing because most of the autopsies that we did at the Los Robles Regional Medical Center back then were on people who died from complications of chronic disease. So I can tell you, AJ, firsthand, now most physicians never get to do this. I did over 75 autopsies. I mean, I did a lot of them. Amazing, amazing. And, and I had the distinct duty for every single person to take their entire intestinal tract out of the body cavity into a big deep wash base and take my surgical scissors and split open all 18 to 25 feet of intestinal tract and wash it out by hand. No, I think uh, this is, uh, this again proves that you have to have interest from the beginning if yeah. you want to become a lifestyle coach. You right. know, I think uh, you have your interest in medicine, you have to interest in, you know, sciences, and you cannot just become a lifestyle coach just because you can talk well. You have to do your homework. You have to be able to talk with a lot of evidence base and a lot of science base. And I think so. I think this is another second message to all the future lifestyle coaches that uh, not just have a coaching uh, coaching ability, but also have ability to understand the science, you know, get into the mud and, uh, you know, dissect the tissue or you know, follow a doctor, whatever necessary. So, well, let me, let me finish the rest of the story because the rest yes, is very yes. interesting. So I got to see the inside of the intestinal tract and I got to see everything else as well in the body. One autopsy changed everything for me, AJ. Tell me, so it, was, it was a woman who came into the hospital in her mid 70s, shortness of breath. They barely drew her blood and they started, they just started to do the medical workup and she passed away. So back then, by law, a person passes away with less than 24 hours of admission, had to have an autopsy to, to determine the cause of death. So the next day, Dr. Glover and I started to do the autopsy. As we started, Dr. Glover said, Reuben, take careful note, we may never see this again. And he was absolutely right. This woman, as we started to do the internal investigation, it was amazing because she had the internal organs as pristine, as flawless, and as perfect as a newborn. It was extraordinary. Like the omentum, you know this, the omentum was clear. You could see right through it. It was extraordinary. And careful dissection revealed that she had an undiagnosed ventral septal defect. Oh. As a cardiologist, you can appreciate this, right? Yeah. Dr. Glover said most people with that defect would rarely have lived past their 20s. Here she was in her 70s. Now, I did her intestinal tract. It was amazing, beautiful, flawless, clean. So Dr. Glover was fascinated. Now, Dr. Glover himself was somebody who was very in tune with health. He was a runner, got his blood drawn every single month. He was on top of all his values, everything else. So he was fascinated, fascinated with this case. 
So he asked to have an interview with the family and I got to sit in and he, he, he shared what he had discovered, but then he asked, how did she live? And what the family member said was that she was a seventh day Adventist who followed the rules and she had a garden in her backyard. She ate everything that she grew. She walked about five miles a day, every single day. She had a positive attitude, active in her church, beautiful, beautiful, amazing social connections in her life. I mean, she really was the example of everything that we talk about in lifestyle medicine. And so Dr. Glover was just fascinated by this. And that led to a whole series of conversations that Dr. Glover and I had about the connection between lifestyle and longevity. And I started to do in research on this information. Who were the Seventh-day Adventists? How did they live? All this stuff. I started looking into this. And so when I went off to medical school, I had this in the background. And I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be a better way. I know I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it. So that's when I went off to do my master's in public health. And when I finished my master's in 1988, I realized that I had an important decision to make. Do I or do I not go back to medical school to complete my training as a physician? And I realized at that point that I was passionate about promoting health and preventing disease. And I was no longer committed to treating disease. So I made a bold decision. I chose not to go back to medical school against the advice of a lot of people. You can imagine, right? And uh, so then I decided to pursue studying lifestyle medicine on my own. There was nothing called lifestyle medicine back then. It didn't exist in 1988. It was not an entity. And I started reading books from people like Dr. John McDougall and Dr. T. Colin Campbell and Dr. Caldwell Usselstyn and all these other people. And so then in 2016, I went to the Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference and I learned about lifestyle medicine for the first time. I was thrilled. I was delighted. I said, oh, my God, I'm in. So in 2017, in October 2017, I went to my first lifestyle medicine conference in Tucson, Arizona. They announced uh, the board certification examination. I said, I'm in because they, they had it for physicians and they also had it for professionals, which is PhDs and masters in a health related field. So I said, I'm doing this. So in 2018, I went to my second lifestyle medicine conference in Indianapolis. At the end of the conference, I sat for the board exam and I passed my exam. So I am board certified. I'm officially, as you know, a diplomate. So in, in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I couldn't be happier. It took me 30 years to find my tribe, but here I am. I so think, that's my uh, story. I think, uh, I think uh, this, some of what you said actually worth repeating. So I'll try my best. Number one. It's so true, Seventh-day Adventists, you know, Loma Linda, one of the blue zone from Dan Buettner, clearly those people live 10 years longer, they're healthier, they're happier, they're driving their cars in the 90s and 100s, they move every hour, you know, they have relationships, they meditate, they don't eat meat. So that way you were already motivated by that before even many of the lifestyle physicians came to know about. Second thing, I completely agree with you. How many physicians, lifestyle physicians, truly have seen the inside of a blue zone person. Not many, to be honest with you. They may have read about them. They may have examined them as a patient, but inside of it, you know, how much visceral fat they have, like you described. I mean, all those things, firsthand you saw it. And the third thing, which speaks so highly of you, that you made a bold, bold call, which many doctors are right now not able to make that bold call, is that go after lifestyle medicine, which may or may not have even those reimbursement codes, insurance may not be even covering for it. And you took a big, big leap, a big, bold decision. And obviously all, all credit goes to the way you think. And that's a reason to be honest with you, bringing you as a guest on our Facebook Live has so much value to our followers, to every physician, who are thinking of doing more lifestyle and less traditional medicine, and also all the future budding lifestyle coaches who can definitely learn from you that this avenue is possible more so than when you were doing it in 80s. And to be adding some more, I took my lifestyle boards 
same same time, same day at Indianapolis. And I'm not going to brag, but I'm going to tell you so everybody knows. I scored second highest among all 400 people. Second highest. When that guy from, you know, the guy with the accent, uh, he called me, he says, Dr. Shah, you were the second highest among all 400. So I was so happy, so proud, because being a cardiologist, lifestyle is still not our field. You know, we are more into doing procedures and prescribing medications. So I was so happy. So I think, uh, I mean, you have a great, great, great story, great attitude, great courage. So uh, let's go to the next thing. Uh, please describe our standard six pillars of healthy lifestyle and be as detailed as you need to go through each one of them so people can learn how to start a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. This is, I love talking about the pillars of lifestyle medicine <laughs> and uh, because I've been living this for such a long time. And by the way, I actually, I realized this in my training. I actually started practicing lifestyle medicine in 1983 when I was a first year medical student because we ran a clinic in Sacramento, a free clinic for the indigents and the migrant farm workers. And I still remember to this day, my first lifestyle medicine patient was a migrant farm worker. He was in his mid fifties, came into the clinic with intestinal duress. And so he, I, I did the work up on him and he had consistent intestinal problems every morning after breakfast for the next two hours, every morning. And so then I presented him to my preceptor and, and, and he said, so what's your assessment? I said, lactose intolerance. And I said, what makes you think that? And he said, because I had the same exact symptoms and two years ago, Dr. Glover diagnosed me. I cut out the ice cream and the dairy and my symptoms went away. He says, hmm, fascinating. What are you going to do? I'm going to educate him about dairy and how it's not appropriate for the human body and then have him come back in a week. He said, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. He was very, very skeptical, but that's what I did. And the next week, the, the migrant farm worker came back. He gave me this big hug and he was so grateful and so thankful because he was free of pain, free of pain by doing one thing, cutting out dairy. It was amazing. So... <laughs> So that's, so the first pillar of lifestyle medicine that I'll share about is nutrition. It's nutrition and it's really important because most people don't know about nutrition. They, they think about the micronutrients and the vitamins and the minerals and all that stuff and the carbohydrates and proteins and fat, but there's, there's so much more. And it's really much more simply a put. So it's a whole food as opposed to a processed food diet. So we want whole food, not, nothing added, nothing taken away, whole foods. All right, and, it, and we want no, no processed foods. We have 65%, 63% of the American diet is processed foods. It's horrific. I mean, we have way too much added oils and sugars and processed refined flours. I mean, we gotta get rid of that. So the processed foods, none of that. So we want a whole food diet and we want plant-based as opposed to animal-based. Because animal-based, I got news for you. I mean, it causes inflammation just like that. And so it's just like, it's ridiculous. And we know this now, we've got the research that's substantial. We've got hundreds and hundreds of research studies to back this all up now. So the thing is we need a plant-based diet and we know the plant-based diet actually helps us to, to reverse the stem, the tide of inflammation and to really help us to heal. And the thing that I talk about a lot is that if you, if you look back, I mean, in our medical school training, we learned about the central nervous system as the first organ system to get created in the human body when we studied embryology. That's the foundation of our health. It really is. So we're either in the sympathetic state or we're the parasympathetic state and everything affects us in one state or the other. Sympathetic is all about survival. It's all the primal state in our, our way of being. The parasympathetic is the powerful state and the healing state, the thriving state. So what we have to do is recognize that everything affects our central nervous system state. We can be in one or the other in any given moment. We can go back and forth between the two, but we can only be in one or the other. The food that we eat affects our central nervous system. Plants put us in the parasympathetic state. Animals put us in the sympathetic state. Processed food puts us in the sympathetic state. So it's real important to have a what I call a parasympathetic diet. Really makes a difference. It's huge. It's a huge difference. No, I think, and our body uh, I naturally heals itself. Go ahead. 
I think you covered the diet so well. I think I agree with you. I think standard American diet truly is a sad SAD diet. And I think uh, we've been seeing this chronic disease mostly because of our diet. I think people, if you look at the data, people are exercising as equal what we did. If anything, we are exercising slightly more compared to the last 20, 30 years because of this exercise uh, motivation affair and gyms opening up. But our diet consistently is going down, consistently is going down. And like you said, uh, Plus, I think we also have, and again, this is a great feeling. I also have recorded a about 20 minute long video on how to enhance your parasympathetic tone. And I agree with you. I think food plays a large role how your parasympathetic tone is. And people with parasympathetic tone, not only are healthier and happier, they live longer, they're more successful, they're more leaders. So parasympathetic tone has a great value. So I think uh, let's talk about physical activity or exercise. Absolutely critically important to have physical activity. We're designed to move. I mean, it's really, really important. So we need to, we have far too much sedentary lifestyle in today's world. I mean, we have far too many people that are sitting on their butts for far too long. So we've got to be able to move. I'm a former collegiate swimmer and I played basketball at, at a very high level. And so the thing is, we've got to move. We've got to be able to do that. Now, a lot of people say, well, I, I don't have the time to do it or I don't have the energy uh, I can't burn enough calories. I'll just eat less. No. The reason why, and I, I tell this to everybody, the, the number one reason why we need to exercise is to change our physiology. So what we know is this, at the cellular level, when we exercise consistently for at least 20 minutes a day at the aerobic level, we will start to induce an increased number and size of the mitochondria inside the cells. Now, as a coach, I've coached swimmers for 40 years, all right? So the number one thing I'm trying to do with my athletes is to get them to have maximum mitochondria in the cells because you know what? That leads to increased performance. That's like pistons in an engine. So if you've got a, a little four-cylinder Honda Civic, it cannot do a whole lot. And so when you exercise, what you can do, and this is the most amazing thing, we can actually have the ability to transform our four-cylinder Honda Civic into a 12-cylinder Lamborghini, which would you rather drive? So that's the essence of exercise. And it's really important to be able to be engaged in that. I mean, it, that's, it's changing physiology. It's not about the calories. It's you can actually change at the cellular level how much metabolism you have, you have and, and the energy, and you feel better. You have more energy. You can do more. You have more stamina. You have more endurance. It's, it's incredible. So I that's exercise. I, I agree. I think physical activity, I think, is a second pillar. And I think, uh, like you said, we need 20 to 30 minutes. Recommendation is 150 minutes a week. So yeah. after that, the benefits start plateauing out. So people say, I don't have time. Just find 20, 25 minutes. And I absolutely love the way you describe the mitochondria because you know that's a emerging science. I think people are learning, people are realizing by doing muscle biopsies and other things. But you don't need a marathon runner to increase your mitochondria. You can just do it with 20, 30 minutes a day of a brisk walk or a light jog. And most people can train to do that. You know, unfortunately in America, people walk about two or 3,000 steps a day. And I think that's a, that's a shame because, uh, I mean, when people say they don't have 20 minutes, many times they are watching Netflix for two hours or CNN or Fox for two hours. Just find 20 minutes, you know, get on the treadmill and watch the same show, but walk instead of sit on the couch and eat an ice cream. So I think I agree with you. How about sleep? What do you think about sleep? Oh, sleep. Oh, so important for our health. And, you know, I love the line, um, a sh shorter sleep equals shorter life. Shorter sleep equals shorter life. I mean, really, when you have to think about it, we have so much sleep deprivation here in the United States. The average person now in the United States sleeps just under six hours a night, which is really not good at all. We need seven to eight hours of sleep. So we are seriously deprived in terms of our sleep. One important statistic, I don't know if you know this one, but it's really interesting. And as a cardiologist, you, 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 you would, might would like to know this one, but uh, Matthew Walker wrote a book, uh, talks about this in his uh, TED talk on sleep. But 
it's an interesting phenomenon. And this shows you just how dramatic sleep is and how important it is. When we shift to daylight savings time in the spring, so we spring forward, we lose an hour of sleep. And this is in numerous countries and almost 2 billion people. So we have a large data pool for this. The next day, we show a 24% increase in heart attacks. You can set a timer to it. 24% increase in heart attacks. By the way, accidents and suicides go up as well. In the fall, when we fall back and we gain that extra hour of sleep, in all those countries, in all those people, we see a 21% decrease in heart attacks. No, I think uh, I think I agree with you. I think sleep is very undervalued. I think uh, people in this fast-paced world, people think sleep is actually wasting of time, but actually sleep is actually investing into time, not wasting in time. And I agree with Matthew Walker. And just give you another simple, you know, interesting statistics. When they looked at the judges who were sleep deprived by one hour because of this time change, they actually put more people in jail because they did not sleep. So it's just not at a personal level, but it's at a societal level too. And I think that there are even some movement now where to see if this the time uh, the time shift should happen or not. Even schools suffer because of that. So I think sleep is a very important pillar. How about uh, substance abuse and alcohol? Oh, another one of my favorite topics to talk about. So. <laughs> So the thing is, there's, there are substances that affect our health and our life dramatically. And most people don't think about this. I mean, we put drugs into our body all the time, all the time. I mean, most people don't realize, for instance, there is no safe level of alcohol. There is none, no safe level of alcohol. It kills cells. It kills brain cells. It causes a sympathetic reaction in the body, just like that. So it's, it's a harmful substance. There's no safe level of alcohol. They actually redid the research based on the, the old alcohol research that was done by the alcohol industry, the famous J-curve. And when they actually, they, they showed that the first group, the abstainers were actually two groups of people, people who never had alcohol, but also people who were in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> So when they split them up, then they had a straight line progression. So it's very important to get. There's no safe level of alcohol. Sorry if that burst your bubble, okay? Sorry, but that's just the truth. I just want you to know the truth. Refined sugar is, is a drug. It is a drug, all right? Get it. It is a refined man-made substance. It is a drug, and it affects the hippocampus stronger than cocaine, all right? Now, don't turn to the cocaine. Cocaine will kill you. All right, but the sugar is killing you too. So we want to don't we don't need the sugar. All right, we don't need nicotine. Nicotine, by the way, one pure drop of nicotine on your skin would kill you within five seconds, just like that. It's so toxic. So you want to stay away from nicotine. But the kissing cousin of nicotine, most people don't realize, nicotine. You can look this up. It's an alkaloid. All right. So nicotine, the kissing cousin of nicotine. And the extraction process for both these compounds is exactly the same. The kissing cousin is caffeine. Caffeine is an alkaloid. By the way, wonderful pesticides, both of them. Wonderful. They kill the bugs in the gardens beautifully. All right. Absolutely beautifully. Now, I used to be addicted to caffeine and sugar, I can tell you. All right. So it affects me so dramatically now because actually if I even touch caffeine, the blood vessels in my eyes will rupture and I'll get floaters in my visual field. So there is no, so caffeine is a drug, my friends. Okay. It's a drug and it has adverse effects. We actually show research studies substantially showing that heavy coffee drinkers, four cups of coffee a day or more have six to 700% increased risk of kidney failure. Why do that? So those are the substances. No, no I, think, uh, I, think the, I think the way you describe this pillar, to be honest with you, I've not even heard from many physicians, this detailed understanding, this much passion. And I think essentially saying that all these substances, including nicotine and caffeine, are essentially are poison. And I think, uh, I think obviously it's an important pillar, but many physicians, 
you know, because either they have some substance abuse themselves, and uh, like just in 40s and 50s, many physicians smoke. I think, uh, uh, I think to me, substance abuse is an important pillar, very under underappreciated, and a person like you can definitely teach people, teach physicians, how to give more more information to people about substance abuse, about the stress management. Stress the management. Next pillar, the next pillar. Stress, so, I'm sorry? The next pillar, stress management. Stress, manage, stress management is a wonderful pillar to talk about because, I mean, we show that anywhere from about 75 to 85% of all physician visits are related to stress. So it's a major factor when it comes to our health. And when we are in the state of stress, it puts us in the sympathetic state. And there's a whole series of effects that happen into our body. So it's real important to understand that stress has a traumatic, dramatic effect. So one of the things that I came, I came personally to understand about stress was when I was in medical school. It's a funny story. So I'm studying for my cardiopathophysiology exam. Now we, <laughs> now we, were, we were studying hypertension of all things, right? Hypertension. And we had exams every Monday, <laughs> AJ, every Monday, okay? So, <laughs> so our weekends were spent studying. <laughs> So here it was two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and I'm studying hypertension. And I say to myself, hmm, out of curiosity, I think I'll check my blood pressure. So I check my blood pressure, 170 over 110, not good. Okay, so now I'm, I'm able to run up and down a basketball court for an hour, no problem, I'm fit, I'm healthy, okay. But what's this with the blood pressure? I said, there must be some mistake. So I checked it again. 170 over 110. I checked, checked it five minutes later after doing all these deep breaths and con, trying to calm myself down. 170 over 110. I had a problem. So I started studying about the stress-related causes of heart disease. Dr. Robert Elliott, I'm sure you know that name. So he wrote a book, Is It Worth Dying For? And I started to understand the connection between long-term stress and the cortisol hormone being elevated and adrenaline and being able to scar the blood vessels and everything else that was going on. So I started realizing I was a hot reactor. So I started studying about stress extensively. And what I came to discover is this, is that my, when I'm stressed, it is a combination of my perception combined with my reaction. So the common denominator is me. And so that's an inside job. So there are three doors that I talk about in my stress management seminar is learning how to deal with external stressors, which are things that we have very little to no control about. Second, dealing with our relationships, interpersonal relationships, where we have some control, but we don't have total control, even though we would like to. <laughs> and then the third area are the internal stressors. So the things that we come up in our own mind about, our own fears, our own worries, anxieties, stresses, those stresses. So it's important to really address, I do a whole seminar on this, it's on my YouTube channel. And so it, I really talk about skills and practices because we need to be able to develop our tool chest for being able to deal with stress. Most people don't have enough tools in their tool chest. And so it's really important to set up enough tools. When I work with, with uh, uh, clients on lifestyle medicine approach, I look to see how many tools do they have in their tool chest to deal with stress. And most of the time they don't have enough. So it's really important that we practice enough things and there's a variety of things. So that's a little uh, bit about stress. I, no, I think, I think that's an excellent point you made. Stress actually, for me, it's into all other pillars. And I think uh, when people are stressed, they don't exercise, they have emotional eating, their relationship crumbles, they drink alcohol. So I think stress actually can be a root of many of the other unhealthy pillars. So I think uh, like yesterday, I just learned that uh, if you have one hour, instead of exercising one hour, exercise 30 minutes, but the remaining 30 minutes, put into stress management. That could be meditation, that could be music, that could be observing your breath, that could be anything which reading, whatever you like, sitting in the sun, walking in the nature, mm -hmm. but lower your stress because that could help other pillars exponentially. So I agree with you. And I think, uh, so how do you handle stress for yourself? I'm sure, you know, stress in the world, everybody goes through that. How do you handle it? And what is your simple advice to people start managing stress? 
Very good, very good. So, uh, so I'll, I'll start with the first pillar, which is being able, the first aspect, the first door of stress, which is external stressors. So this is, to me, it's all about taking care of myself. All right, how do I take care of myself? So this is everything that we talk about in lifestyle medicine, eating, eating really healthy, a whole food plant-based diet really makes a difference. Drinking enough water, mm, believe it or not, that's a huge area. And in fact, that's, for me, that's the seventh pillar of lifestyle medicine because most people are dehydrated. You know this, everybody that comes to the hospital, first thing we do is put them on an IV solution. <laughs> They're dehydrated. So, so most people don't drink enough water, it hydrates the brain, hydrates the body. We need water to have the body actually function. If you were stranded out in the desert, first thing you'd be looking for would be water. So you gotta have enough hydration. Uh, being able to uh, exercise consistently, the consistent pattern is really important. And, and, and practices, I mean, being able to take care of myself. I love to dance, all right? Dancing salsa to me is a fabulous, fabulous stress management practice, it really is. Yesterday I went for a hike, all right? And, and went to some waterfalls, beautiful, all right? Spent some time in nature. In Japan, physicians are actually prescribing forest bathing for their patients who have high amounts of stress. So being able to spend time in nature is a beautiful thing. Meditation is one of my daily practices. I do that all the time. So, I mean, all these are things that I do. That's, that's just external stressors. Number two, in terms of relationships, there's a lot more there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then the third thing is being able to address this, the mindset, because we say things to ourselves all the time that put us in a state of stress. We say negative limiting belief statements to ourselves all the time. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not worthy enough. I don't deserve it. It'll never be me. We say all those kinds of things. So we have to learn how to program our subconscious mind. And being able to say affirmation statements is really, really important. I have a whole set of affirmation statements that I say every day to go through these every day. I create my life. I am completely responsible for my life. I am willing to create an amazing life filled with health, energy, and vitality. I've got a couple dozen more. All right. So I say these things to myself. Why? Because I have to reprogram the wiring that's there, that's been there since childhood. And it, it will never go away. So I need to be practicing this on an ongoing basis. So it's critically important for my health that I take care of my mental, emotional, and spiritual health by being able to reprogram my subconscious mind. No, I think I agree with you. I think, uh, I think self-care is important. And I think uh, as many of our listeners and followers know, Daniel Ammon, he's the neurology psychiatrist who has done like the thousands, hundreds, thousands uh, CT scans of the brain. And he coined this term called ANTS, A-N-T-S. I think it stands for like automatic negative talks or thoughts or something. But I agree with you, how you talk to yourself because within whatever your awake hours are, and maybe even during the sleep, during your awake hours, most talk you do is to yourself. And how you treat yourself during your talk to yourself is so critical. So I think that you cover stress in a very, very right way that uh, we need to take care of ourselves in our, not just in our physical way, but also talking to ourselves in our mental way. Let's go to the next pillar. How about relationship? Ah, uh, the sweetness of relationships. So what we show in the research is that actually the most significant factor for our longevity happens to be relationships having healthy relationships and studying the blue zones actually contributes to our healthy longevity more than even your cholesterol level. So it's really important. The Harvard study that's been done since 19, uh, I think it was 1938 that they started the, yeah, 1938 that they started the program. It's still going today. So 82 years later, it's still happening. So that was the sophomore class at Harvard University and they've studied their descendants and other groups of people ever since then. It's pretty remarkable. So it's really an amazing level of, of influence in our health. I just finished writing chapter 19 in my upcoming book, which is all about how to create a thriving, healthy lifestyle, which will be, it'll be the complement of Dr. Michael Greger's book, his book, How Not to Die, my book, How to Fully Live. Wow, amazing. So chapter 19 is on creating healthy relationships. 
And I just finished writing that chapter and it's wonderful. I mean, there's so much to it. Most of us don't know what constitutes a healthy relationship. Most of us don't know how to create that. And there's a lot to it. I'm a student of relationships. I realized that after two relationships and four children that I was the common denominator. And when it came to relationships, I was willing to say, I know nothing. <laughs> I'm, I'm a smart monkey when it comes to biology and science and physics and chemistry, all that good stuff. Not a problem, right? But when it came to relationships, I realized I knew nothing. And so I started studying relationships about 25 years ago. And I delved into this for quite some time. I've done workshops and seminars and books and everything else. And this is a fascinating area because the, 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 the dynamic of relationships really can offer us so much. And it's a beautiful thing. And one of my practices, so I have to share this. I know we're just on a short amount of time, but one of my practices in really learning about how to interact in relationships has been partner dancing. So 20 years ago, I was invited to take up salsa dancing to help me to learn how to actually anchor the concepts of relationships into my life. So what I've learned from salsa dancing for almost 20 years is that I, as a leader, I create a safe space for my partner to step into. I have to be completely trustworthy and transparent so that the moment she holds my hands, she will know, she will feel that she can trust me in that instant. It's kinesthetic. I am completely responsible for the choreography of the dance. She cannot make any mistakes because anything she does is inside of my leadership. I have to coach her to make sure that she stays connected with me. <clears throat> I have to lead her from where she is, not from where I think she should be. And I have to be a gentle man in being able to lead her, keeping her safe, keeping the rhythm and making sure that she's having a great time and not being bored. <laughs> yeah. That's the essence of relationship. And it's a beautiful thing. And I've learned so much for myself in this process of really taking up partner dancing because to me, relationships is a dance. And when you can actually learn how to dance together in relationships, then you can actually be harmonious and elegant and in, in synchronicity. And it can be a beautiful thing. And it's constantly changing. It's constantly a dynamic process. The music may change, but you can still dance no matter what the circumstances. So that, that is my metaphor, but it's more than a metaphor. That's my training ground for relationships. And it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I've danced so much over the years. I've learned so much about myself and I'm still a work in progress. No, I think you call relationships so well again. I think this is something of a lacking in many livestock physicians, but you have studied it, you have experienced yourself and you have kind of uh, learned from your own life experiences. But I agree, I think loneliness is as bad as smoking when it comes down to heart disease and heart attack. And I think like you said, like you clearly said, blue zones, I think partly is because of relationship. And I said relationship is not just with your spouse, your life partner, but it has to do with your other family members, your daughter, your son, your brother, your sister, your friends, your church members, your temple, synagogue, mosque members, your community members. And for that sake, anybody in the world, I think giving a stranger just a simple smile in a train has proven to improve so many beneficial hormones in your body. Just a stranger giving a smile. You don't have to even talk a single word. So I agree with you. I think relationship many times doesn't have to be even like a like a spoken relationship. It can be just a just a just a, a, a gesture of just a simple smile. So I think relationship, and again, all these six pillars, they exponentially increase each other's value. They all dance in concert, and we need all six of them. Yes. So my next uh, big question is uh, uh, like a uh, you practice in California. Do you take 
your clients from all over the country or is it limited to California? All over the world. All over the world. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All humans qualify. <laughs> so tell us, uh, tell us how any of our follower, we have all over the world now, how they can reach out to you, how they can check you out. Please give your, your website address. Please give us some idea on what they will get into, what service they will get, and like uh, what kind of uh, cost they are looking. You don't have to go in details because they always can find out by going with you one-on-one, -on -one, but whatever you can share with us so people who are interested can at least reach out to you. Certainly. So what um, I have my website and it's www.coachruben, as it says right back here, coachruben.com. And so that's my website. And my email address is coachruben at coachruben.com. So it's really simple to remember. And so they can reach out to me and just check out. I have my services that I provide. Um, so the basis for how I coach. And so I, I like to explain that the basis for how I coach, because I have a four point plan. Because what happened to me after I finished my master's in public health, two years later, I ruptured my Achilles tendon while playing basketball. So 1990, I ruptured my Achilles and this, I had emergency surgery and the surgeon told me I would never play basketball again. So I became depressed and it devastated me. So I became a junk food vegan and <laughs> I put on the weight over the course of the next four and a half years, I became 55 pounds heavier than you see me today. And so then a friend of mine who I respected, he walked up to me one day and he called me chubby. He said, getting a little chubby there, Ruben. And so then I got mad first at him, but then I got mad at myself. And I realized I had done it to myself. I had caused my own issues. And so I, at, at that point, I made a solemn vow to myself that I would never be unhealthy again. I went back to using what I knew would work. And being a, an athlete and being a coach for many years, I started to apply what I'd learned. And I went back to the wisdom of Coach Wooden and many other things. So first step, you have to change your mindset, your thinking, your attitude, your consciousness and or, or awareness. You have to start here. We must begin from within. And Einstein said it well, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. So we have to change our mindset. That's what it starts with first. And that's the, that's the hardest work is really shifting the mindset, all the talk that we have with ourselves, all the negative self-limiting beliefs, that has to change. Second step is that we need to have a proven strategy because like Einstein said, again, doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. So let's not go there. So let's have a proven strategy. Number three, we have to be intelligent about setting ourselves up for success with support and accountability. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is successful by themselves. It doesn't happen. Nobody gets to the Olympic games with no support and accountability. Nobody gets to graduate from high school with no teachers and no books. So we have to be intelligent about surrounding ourselves with the right kind of support. And that's the beauty of lifestyle medicine, being able to do that. And then even that is still not enough. We need the fourth step. And this is so critical because I tell people this all the time is that we need to be able to have a track record of consistency in order to develop the habits that will lead to a permanent change in lifestyle because habits produce results. Habits produce results. Now to change one habit, we know in the research, you know, 21 to 30 days of practicing one thing for 30 days can help you to change one habit. But how many habits does it take, take to change a lifestyle? It could be 20, 30, 40 habits or more. So this is going to take a lot more work and a consistency and a track record. And it's no different than how a person becomes a champion swimmer, which I've done for 40 years. I've developed champion swimmers. I've had three go to the Olympic trials. I've had over three dozen go off to college on, on scholarship and swim. 
So I know it's the same exact approach. What I learned from swimming, I've applied it to, to health. I've applied it to business. It, it applies and it works. It's the same approach. So people can work with me. They can do a lifestyle medicine consultation. So that's where I, I invite people if they really want to get started on their journey to changing their lifestyle is do a consultation. And because what they'll do is they'll fill out an extensive amount of information. They, they fill out a, a lifestyle medicine history, a stress scale, a lifestyle habits um, a survey. And then if they have any blood work for me to review, I'll review that as well. And then we'll set up a two hour consultation. I'll sit down with them and I'll go over the, all their information and then I'll help them to design a personalized lifestyle medicine plan for them to get started. And then I'll also send a follow-up email with loads of information, including recipes, you know, resources, videos, TED Talks, whatever. So I set them up for success. The service is for $275. It's well worth it. To be, honest, I you, yeah, so. to be honest with you, what you describe, to be honest with you, I've never heard the way you are doing it. I don't think many doctors are doing it and they are charging a lot more. I've not seen even many other programs where they charge thousands of dollars. I think your program is not just so comprehensive, but I think it speaks for your dedication, for your passion, for your intense desire for every client to succeed with this four point program is your own unique creation. And I think to me, to be honest with you, I think uh, if I had to go to a coach, I would go to you. I think, uh, and I may take up on that. I think uh, that that's very impressive. And I hope all of our followers and listeners, and this will be on YouTube too, take up this opportunity because this will be, like I always said, this will be a biggest investment of your life. And you will actually reap the benefits and you will recover the cost in less than a year and for the rest of your life once you go out on your own track rest of the life you will save thousands of dollars i mean when i do a stress test on somebody with a nuclear material it costs them thousand dollar thousand dollar you know so i think what you are providing is such a smaller cost compared to people come and see me for some of the unnecessary things just because you know i think uh, i'm glad we brought you on and i think many lifestyle coach can look up to you, can learn from you, you know, and I think uh, one day you should, in my opinion, you should have a lifestyle coaching school. Well, thank you. I, I think that's a great idea, actually. That's been part of my vision in the future, is being well, able to us, train uh, how, lifestyle medicine coaching. If somebody wants to become a lifestyle coach, what yeah. avenue, what, what kind of education they would need, how they can become certified through American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and how many years it would take after a high school? Well, let's see. So after high school, so they would need to become, if they wanted to become board certified as a lifestyle medicine professional, which is what I am, then they would have to have a master's or a PhD, but they can become a lifestyle medicine coach. So they can do that by getting a college degree. So they need to have a bachelor's in, and I, I would recommend that they're, they, they have a bachelor's in something that's health related, a very strong interest but with a lot of emphasis on psychology because it's very important because when you're dealing with people, you need to be able to have some tools and understanding of how to motivate people, how to inspire people, how to be a champion for them. So it's real important. So to be a coach, it's, it's 80% psychology. It really is. So it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, I'm, I'm just, my master's actually, I specialize in behavioral sciences. So that really helps me so much and then have some experience actually coaching. I mean, I can't tell you, I've seen so many people that say, oh, I wanna be a coach. And I said, have you ever coached any kids teams or a soccer team or a basketball team or anything else? And they've never done any of that. I said, start there because you want the practice of actually working with young children is a great thing, all right? Really work with them because you learn so much really fast about coaching by being able to do that I, and, and leadership. You learn about leadership and you learn about guidance and being positive and being supportive. And you learn a lot about that. So it's really important to me that a lot of people actually take up that kind of an opportunity and that challenge. Being able to interact with people is really the greatest thing because you, you have to be a, a cheerleader. You have to be a really good cheerleader to be a good coach. It's really important. 
and you have to have your skills and you have to have your knowledge granted but you can always learn those things but you have to really develop the experience of being a cheerleader for people and, and being able to encourage and support them in the best way possible so there's a lot of work to be done there um ideally it'd be somebody who has you know uh, a lot of training in psychology a lot of training in the sciences and they're they're really great with people and they have experience coaching a sports team or two and they've done really well with that that would be great and then they can step into being a lifestyle medicine coach which i think would be fabulous i think uh, your answer will help so many thousands of people who want to be lifestyle coach and that's a growing field so i think your answer will definitely will be repeated again and again on youtube every time they watch it and we will stress on that and i think uh, i think i agree with you i think uh, some kind of uh, passion and some kind of uh, and i always say that even though eq the emotional quotient is mm -hmm. something you know people have it but emotional quotient is almost like a muscle you can improve your emotional quotient and if you want to be a coach you have to have empathy you have to have high levels of eq and you can learn and you can increase your eq so i think i strongly advise all the coach all the budding coach to make sure you exercise your eq to get into the highest level because when you seeing that person he is coming to you with a lot of hope a lot of expectations a lot of hand holding and he comes with so much of a so much of a desire to change and if you don't do your role that person may never seek out another coach so you may be the last coach so you have a larger burden on your shoulder to be a coach and i think uh, i take this thing as a big responsibility when i teach people either in person or on social media i take it as a very big responsibility just like you take it because if i turn off one person that person may never go see another coach again so i think uh, i admire the way you do it so let me ask you one more question okay. then i will have a concluding remarks from you i okay. saw that you also have other coaching uh, uh, programs including like communication work life balance what do you what do you say in terms of uh, adding those to a lifestyle coach a whole program because i think many people many young people like 30 40 year old the health is fair they are living reasonably health life but they have other needs including work life balance including speech including communication you know other other personality development so tell us do you do those things and what do you, what do you recommend that so so i wear <clears throat> so professionally i wear two major hats but they go together so in one area i wear the hat of a lifestyle medicine professional so i empower people to prevent reverse and treat chronic disease to live a thriving healthy happy life and the other hat that i wear is that of an executive and business performance coach so i was in hospital administration for many many years so i've learned a lot about leadership and so what i do is i work with executives i'm a speaker for vistage international which is the world's largest ceo membership organization and and i'm also on the faculty for the emerging leaders program so i train up and coming leaders uh, in large organizations so the thing about it is that to be a leader you need to be healthy because unhealthy leaders are less than fully productive leaders so we need to be able to put the two together so i combine them for me it works really beautifully i love it i love it so much and it's really great but you know to be a healthy leader you've got to have a healthy life and so it's important to have your healthy life and then from there we can have a healthy leader and then we can develop healthy organizations so i actually empower organizations to have a healthy workforce so i'm i'm actually part of the committee for lifestyle medicine in the workplace with the american college of lifestyle medicine and so i am actually doing workplace lifestyle medicine programs which i'm so excited about because it's about being able to do an immersion program for the employees of a company so that we actually transform the health and the vitality and the productivity and even the profitability of a company and an organization which makes sense to me to me that this is a beautiful niche for us to actually make a change in terms of lifestyle medicine being impactful in changing healthcare because when the workplace is transformed into a lifestyle medicine workplace 
now we have a healthy workforce and now we have people that are negotiating for better rates on their healthcare plans. Now we're having more of an influence in, in terms of being able to have the, the organizations say and demand, we want our health plan to be able to take care of our people in a much more effective way. And that's lifestyle medicine. So I think I, I agree with you. I think uh, personally, I also believe that the six pillars are not enough. No. So we have actually expanded to a lot more than six pillars. And next time when we meet, next time we talk, I'll explain my reasoning for expanding all these pillars. And that includes a parenting, that includes a woman empowerment, that includes mm -hmm. animal welfare, that includes environment, that includes finance and career. You know, that includes, uh, you know, many other things. And I think uh, even your civic duties, because all those things are important to be a complete, complete successful person. You know, I think that if we want to expand and we want to make people flourish in all areas of life, because if a healthy person is not able to hold a job, whatever the reason, that person eventually will be eating cheap processed food or cheap fast food. So I think everything permeates into life, not just health, but everything, all the aspects of life. So I'm glad you wear two, three, four, five hats. And I think I'm hoping to learn from you about how to wear more than one hat just as a lifestyle physician. So I will give you some concluding remarks to make, and then we will stop. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I mean, just, it's, it's a wonderful thing that we're now in a place where we can use social media, we can use technology to start to spread the words and the, spread the message of lifestyle medicine. And it's a beautiful thing, it's a wonderful thing. I'm so grateful for your partnership and to be able to, to, you know, to, be able to share in your vision and your mission and what you're up to. Because I, likewise, I mean, I'm out to doing the same thing. I mean, we're all pioneers in this world of being able to truly change the world. I mean, we are the trailblazers. We really are because we believe passionately in creating a world in which people are healthy and they're thriving and they're free of chronic disease. Like what a world that could be. What kind of a world would it be for our grandchildren to be able to grow up and they look in the history books and say, you had something called heart disease? You had something called cancer? You had something called diabetes? What was that? And I would love to see that world where those chronic diseases become stories of the past and they're all gone. So thank no, that's, you. That's great. No, I think this was one of the one of the best lives we had. I think that this brings so many different aspects to lifestyle medicine. And we are bringing you back probably every six months to get an update more from you, from your experience, from your knowledge. And I think uh, you are going to be, you know, not you're going to be, you are my lifelong friend now, even a possibly a mentor. I think we can definitely learn from you. I can learn from you. And I think your program is a unique program. So big, big congratulations. Keep helping the world and keep helping all of us. So thank you, Ruben, and have a great evening. Thank you, Ajay.